With a vision of an empowered Duwamish Valley community thriving in a healthy and just environment, we are so excited tonight to host this event featuring three drivers behind the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, a nonprofit devoted to elevating the voice of folks impacted by Duwamish River pollution and other environmental injustices. Our community is fortunate, grateful for the, and grateful for their passionate leadership. BJ Cummings is a founder of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and previously served as executive director of Sustainable Seattle. She's currently manager of community engagement for the Superfund Research Program at the University of Washington. She's the author of two books, including Damn the Rivers, Damn the People from 1990. The second, well, we'll get there in a moment. James Rasmussen is a member of the Duwamish tribe. He is the founding director of the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center and is the Superfund manager for the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. Paulina Lopez is a first generation immigrant from Ecuador and a human rights law advocate. She is the executive director of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. They're here tonight to celebrate the publication of Cummings' second book from University of Washington Press entitled The River That Made Seattle, A Human and Natural History of the Duwamish. Please join me in welcoming James Rasmussen and Paulina Lopez, but first, BJ Cummings. Hi, thank you so much. Um, for welcoming us all here today, and deep gratitude to the Duwamish tribe for hosting us here in Se the Seattle area on their traditional land. Um, I'd like to begin, usually, <laughs> as always, with a question for our audience, which is um, why you're here on maybe not such a beautiful, slightly drizzly, but still, you know, an open evening to talk about um, a river that had been all but forgotten just a generation ago. What is it that compels you to care about it enough to join us in this discussion of our river's history tonight? My theory is that it's because in the last couple of decades, we've come to understand the Duwamish River as a reflection of ourselves. So why is it that the Duwamish River matters to you? James Rasmussen, who is Duwamish and a central figure in this book, once answered that question by saying, that's like asking me why my grandmother matters. Our family shapes us, our places mold us, and our river tells us something about who we are. The Duwamish River is a living reflection of Seattle's history. It's central to the character of our city. It tells us a lot about who we are and who we've been. After spending two decades getting to know this river and the resiliency of its ecosystems and its people, I think the story of the Duwamish also shows us a lot about who and what we can be. So I think that's why we're all here tonight. Um, I'd like to start off with a brief reading about my own introduction to the Duwamish River to get us going. I first saw the river bend where it passed the historic village of Yuliquat from a kayak in the spring of 1994. My center of gravity below the waterline as I cut through the narrow channel a concave wall of ash fine sand rose from the water on my left, binding together a layer of ancient clamshells still visible in the eroded bank. Belted kingfishers trilled as they skipped from tree to tree ahead of my boat and a great blue heron skimmed low, flushed from the reeds on my right. Ahead, a mudflat extended around the bend, alive with speckled shorebirds scurrying along the water's edge. I felt I had passed into another time, one before barges and smokestacks and sewer grates. Just 10 minutes earlier, I'd been leading a team of kayakers along Seattle's concrete lined Duwamish waterway in a training session for volunteers with the Puget Soundkeeper Alliance's Kayak Patrol, a citizen Navy of sorts, ferreting out illegal dumping and industrial discharges fouling Seattle's waters. Airplanes and cranes cast shadows over the water and the din of engines and machines drowned out our shouted attempts at conversation. Paddling with cameras and notepads tethered to our boats, we were searching for and finding unauthorized sources of pollution. I'd only been on the Duwamish River once before with Lee Moyer, a former Boeing engineer who made a post-retirement career of designing and building kayaks. We had stuck to the wide shipping channel that day getting familiar with the many factories and pipes that lined the waterway. The channel had been built straight, dredged deep, and lined with industrial berths. There was nothing natural about it. On this training excursion, I decided to hang a hard left 
after leading the volunteers past the last of a line of factories. With 20 minutes to kill before our session ended, I led the group behind the remnant of a small island just north of the factory. The serene meander we found ourselves paddling along and its sudden proliferation of wildlife was a revelation. It was here that Duwamish tribal chairwoman, Cecile Maxwell, had encountered and stopped a bulldozer from destroying the remains of her tribe's village of Uliquat in 1976. It was here early American settlers had built a bustling neighborhoods of gridded streets and fishing docks in the 1890s. And it was here that the Duwamish tribe had lived in a cluster of longhouses and hosted potlatches for over a thousand years, leaving behind a dense detritus of clamshells. Maxwell's intervention of the bulldozer saved the last remaining bend on the Duwamish River, where we now floated at eye level with the shorebirds. As I've written this book, it's been an honor for me to have the opportunity to see the river through the eyes of people who have made this river basin home for 10,000 years and through the lens of those who've just arrived. Both perspectives are different from my own. I've spent most of my waking hours here for roughly the past 25 years and have developed my unique understanding of the Duwamish River. For those of you who have also spent time here, I'm sure you too have developed your own relationship with the river and have your own stories to tell. And some of those stories are in this book. So I'm gonna switch gears before we bring in um, our guests tonight and take you to a brief PowerPoint slide presentation. I can just switch tax here. Um, I need to share my screen with you. And this should do it. Hopefully, hopefully that's working. So we're gonna start um, with a map of King County and nearly the entire Duwamish watershed um, from the 1880s. And hopefully you guys can see my laser here. Um, the watershed took up most of the county um, and starts in the far south, um, almost to Mount, well, to Mount Rainier, which is actually just off the map here. This is the White River, which is one of the three main rivers feeding into the Duwamish. And it comes down all the way to um, the town that was then called Slaughter, which is now Auburn. Um, and just for context, to make sure we all know where we are, right here, this is downtown Seattle. This is Lake Washington, right? And this is Elliott Bay, to, to get us oriented. Um, the White River is joined at the area we now know as Auburn by the Cedar, sorry, excuse me, by the Green River, which comes all the way down from Stampede Pass. And together, the Green and the White continue down to their junction with the historic Black River, which is very short, but also absorbed all of the flow from the Cedar River here, and also from Lakes Sammamish, the Sammamish River, all of Lake Washington, Lake Washington's tributaries, even Green Lake right here in North Seattle, which was connected to Lake Washington by Ravenna Creek. And all of that water joined the Cedar River at its Southern outlet, where together they flowed through the Black and met the combined flow of the White and Green Rivers. With all of them combined, they then continued down this section called the Duwamps or Duwamish River into what was then Duwamps Bay. Even Lake Washington at that time was known as Lake Duwamps. This is not the watershed that we have today. Massive changes followed white settlement here, um, beginning with the diversion of the White River before it reached Auburn. Um, in 1898, with the help of uh, farmers weary of having their farms flooded um, and armed with dynamite, the White River was diverted down a narrow Stuck River Valley into the Puyallup River and out into Puget Sound as the area um, in what we know as, as Commencement Bay. That change became permanent in 1906, enforced by armed guards from King County who patrolled its banks in order to prevent other farmers from blasting it back. 
When that change became permanent, we lost permanently the connection between the White River and the rest of the Duwamish watershed. Shortly after, in 1912, again, to avoid flooding, a short canal was constructed to divert the Cedar River into Lake Washington uh, before it hit the town of Renton because there were floods in the growing town. Um, at that time, after it was diverted into Lake Washington, it did go back into the Black River by flowing back out, um, but bypassed Renton, saving the city from flooding. That was a, a short-term solution though. The big solution for many of the farmers in the area came in 1916 when two more short canals were built. One from Lake Washington into Lake Union's Portage Bay and the other enlarging a creek from Union Bay out into Puget Sound um, to Shilshoal Bay. And when that happened, Lake Washington dropped seven feet below its outlet in the southern part with the Black River and the Black River as well disappeared. Only the Green River today remains to feed the Duwamish. That wasn't the only change that happened in the watershed, but that in itself was massive. Um, beginning in 1895, the open bay at the mouth of the river, um, right at downtown Seattle, began to be transformed as well. In the early years um, of building out industrial corridors and rail lines, um, colonizers began to use the tidal mudflats to suspend elevated transportation corridors um, and even to build little factory islands like this one here. The mudflats at that time were considered worthless and even pestilent by the early industrialists. Um, one of these, Eugene Semple, who created Harbor Island and its flanking waterways, boasted about his work filling the mudflats by writing, on this land will be founded the major portion of the manufacturing industries of the city by making solid and substantial land where formerly there was water, the rising and falling of the tides, and occasionally bare and unsightly mudflats, which were a menace to the health of the dwellers on the adjacent dry lands. Um, Eugene Semple delivered on his promise, today's Soto, Harbor Island, and West Seattle marine terminals are a testament to his vision. From the original meandering course of the Duwamish River below the historic Black River Junction, which you can see right here, this is the Duwamish, um, the tide flats were followed by a plan to straighten the entire Duwamish River and fill in its old meanders in order to expand industry into the south of Seattle. We're gonna focus on the lower part of the Duwamish River shown here. For a brief period, the straightened waterway, which you can see right in the center, and the original river meanders coexisted, but that was very short lived. Today, the original 12 miles of the lower Duwamish River has been channelized to a short five mile shipping canal and the location of the original river bend that we looked at earlier, originally here, right where the river ended in the open bay, today can be seen here and here. Once at the mouth of the river delta, that river bend is now a mile upriver of the constructed end of the shipping canal and its surrounded built up industrial lands all of this flat land that you see here is constructed. And the river, instead of opening up into the bay here, now continues out and goes around the channels either side of Harbor Island. To put the contemporary Duwamish River in perspective, I'm gonna give you a little virtual tour of one of the original historic reaches of the Duwamish watershed. And hopefully we will not have technical glitches here um, as we go through this little Google Earth tour. Let us see. Okay. The White River, once part of the Duwamish watershed, starts at Emmons Glacier on Mount Rainier. There was a landslide in 1963 that buried the lower portion of Emmons Glacier 
under layers of rock, um, actually preserving it and allowing the glacier to continue growing where most glaciers around the world are now melting. But from an ice cave, the, the White River emerges from the Emmons Glacier, comes all the way around and down Mount Rainier, and is joined just below the town of Greenwater by the Greenwater River, which flows down from Natchez Pass. Some of you may know that that uh, was the path of some of the first settler wagons to arrive here. The White River then continues on down past Enumclaw into what's now Auburn. And at this point is where the diversion that sent it south changed the course of history for the watershed. So it turns here and goes south, no longer flowing north through the town of Auburn to where it was once joined by the Green River. The Green River now comes in and is the sole source of water to the Duwamish. So also in Auburn, the Green River passes through and then the entire river below this that was once called the White continues to flow north through South King County past an area that was historically known as the White River Town. Today, this whole section of the river has been renamed the Green to reflect its sole source of water. And then continuing towards Tukwila, past the historic Black River Junction, which once drained the Cedar River and Lakes Washington and Issaquah, um, but now is just drained by a small amount of wetlands and the occasional overflow from the Renton Sewage Treatment Plant. And then the river continues down until it becomes the Lower Duwamish Waterway. This is where the constructed straight waterway begins. It's also where the Lower Duwamish Waterway Superfund site begins, reflecting its use as an industrial area after the river was straightened. We get one bend right at the historic Boeing Plant 2 across the river from the historic town, now neighborhood, of South Park in South Seattle. Following the straight channel down, we pass the area that were the original land claims um, for all of King County. The Collins, Maple, and Van Asselt families were the first to, um, to file land claims in what's now Seattle, um, specifically in the, again, then town, now neighborhood of Georgetown. And then as we follow the river down, we come to that remaining river bend that we've talked so much about, um, where the historic Duwamish village of Yulikwat stood and where the Duwamish tribe today has built a new longhouse and cultural center directly across the road from that river bend. Everything downriver of that is the constructed, filled, artificial land that we built in order to accommodate shipping and industry. Harbor Island, when it was built, was the largest man-made island in the world. I believe it's now, it now ranks third. And then finally, the river is freed again into the bay at downtown Seattle, behind which you can see Lakes Washington and Union, which were once part of the Duwamish watershed. During the time that all of these changes were taking place, dramatic changes were also taking place among the river's people. White colonial settlement turned the watershed's social landscape upside down. Um, I want to introduce to you one of the families who kept meticulous records of what has happened to them in the seven generations that have passed since white settlement. A couple of decades before the settlers put down roots in the current city of Seattle, the Maples, Collinses, and Van Asselt families, this man, Sabald, and his sister, Chupdalyut, were born to a Black River family in the village of Spavadid. They were highborn or among the leadership class of the region's indigenous people. Sabald became a healer and his sister married Chris Canem, a Skagit chief from Whitby Island, who was an ally of Chief Self and signed the Treaty of Point Elliot alongside him. He and Tupdalyut had two daughters and Sabald became known as Dr. Jack to the settlers or Uncle Jack to his family. Tupdalyut's daughter Kiolitsa moved back from Whitby um, to her mother's ancestral village on the Black River just as the white pioneers were beginning to settle in their homelands. Her family's oral history says that she was then kidnapped by the Yakima nation and later escaped using a canoe and paddle that she stole to make her way back home. She later married a white pioneer who opened the region's first coal mine. And after he died, she married another settler with whom she moved to Vashon Island. Their first daughter, Nellie, was among the Puget Sound area's first generation of mixed native settler children. 
As a teenager, she returned from Vashon to the Seattle area and wound up working in the home of Judge Thomas Burke, an attorney and railroad booster whose name many of us know from the Burke Building downtown and the Burke Gilman Trail, which follows the course of the railroad that he helped build. It um, seems that Nellie learned a great deal about the law and about land transactions from Burke and may have helped her Uncle Jack secure a homestead land claim in the 1890s on the Cedar River, the only such claim ever granted to a Duwamish person in their native homelands. Nellie also married a white immigrant to the territory um, and had a son, Myron Overacker Jr., named after his father. She negotiated a series of land deals that helped gather her Duwamish family back together in their natal watershed. Um, and then Nellie and her husband homesteaded on state-owned land on top of Beacon Hill overlooking Lake Washington. Myron Jr. was a child when the lake level dropped. The Duwamish River was being straightened and the tidelands in Elliott Bay turned into Seattle's industrial powerhouse. And then he wound up working in a shipyard that was one of Harbor Island's first industries. He was also the founding member of the new Duwamish Tribal Council, organized under the governing US laws that were required at that time in order to carry on their tribal governance. By the time Myron Jr.'s daughter, Anne, was born, the Duwamish watershed's transformation was complete. And the population of Seattle had exploded and diversified. She grew up during World War II and remembered their Beacon Hill neighbor, Tadashi Yamaguchi being taken away in 1941 and interred with the rest of his Japanese family. She raised her own son in the same house her grandparents had homesteaded and followed her father in serving on the Duwamish Tribal Council. In this photo, she's holding the canoe paddle that Kiyo used to escape from her abduction by the Yakimas. Anne's son, Chris Kanem and Chip Dalyut's great-great-great-grandson, James Rasmussen, was born in 1955. Um, paraphrasing a description of him as a young man from the book, six feet tall, James carried himself with pride. His brown hair was pulled back in a long ponytail and he sported a thick beard. He was a notable musician in Seattle's jazz scene and at age 24 was following in the footsteps of his mother and grandfather on the Duwamish Tribal Council. We're gonna come back to James and his relationship with the river in a minute. But first, James's niece, his sister's daughter, Christine Nelson, is the seventh generation since Dr. Jack and his sister greeted the first white settlers to Puget Sound. She's also the fourth generation of his family to serve on the modern Duwamish Tribal Council. The changes that this family has witnessed in the watershed and the region are documented in the river that made Seattle and their family's adaptation and resilience are astounding, but they are not alone. Other descendants of Chris Canem, the descendants of Chief Seattle and many others are still with us, as are the descendants of the first settler families. Many of them are actively influencing the future of Seattle to this day. This is certainly true of James. Just as his ancestors did, James has a way of forging alliances with people who are quite different from himself. Um, so I'd like to briefly tell you one of those stories. In 1984, James met John Beale. John was a Vietnam War veteran who moved to the Duwamish Valley in 1976. He suffered from PTSD and at age 29, he had had three heart attacks and was diagnosed as terminal with maybe six months to live. His doctors recommended that he find a hobby he enjoyed and to make peace with his fate. John turned to the little semblance of nature he could find in a deep ravine behind his house with a murky stream thick with blackberry brambles and piles of trash. But grateful for the little refuge it offered him, he resolved to clean it up. He wanted to leave that little patch of nature better than he'd found it. And he succeeded. And much of his story has now been told around the world. He also survived for another 30 years. The part of the story that is much less known is the relationship between James and John. And I'm gonna read you another short passage from the book. South Park's John Beale was an unlikely character to emerge as the Duwamish River's environmental champion in the closing decades of the 20th century. A hard drinking chain smoker with Coke bottle glasses and yellowed teeth, he could often be found smoking a cigarette on a streamside rock while local school children planted saplings nearby 
or released juvenile salmon into the bubbling waters of Ham Creek. But that was after the children had already adopted Beale as their grandfatherly eco-savior and inspirational hero. After they had surrounded Beale while he told them about the regenerative power of nature and their own power to heal the world around them. This right here, Beale would say, using a stick to draw a circle in the dirt around their feet. This is the environment. This is your environment. And what happens to it is up to you. In the 1980s, John Beale approached the Duwamish tribe to ask for help restoring salmon runs in the Duwamish River and its tributary stream in South Park. James was particularly impressed with Beale's work and his passion for the river. The tribe appointed James to be the council's liaison to Beale and his stream restoration efforts. James Rasmussen's family had a long history in tribal leadership dating to pre-contact days. The modern tribal council was organized to replace traditional leadership structure that had been dismantled by colonization and displacement following the occupation of Duwamish lands. James had joined the council in the 1980s. My name is James Rasmussen. That is a very good Indian name. He often joked when introducing himself to audiences who did not know his heritage or his history. My family is very proud to say that we have been part of the leadership of this tribe for many generations. In 1984, the year he met John Beale, Rasmussen still lived on the Beacon Hill property homesteaded by his great grandmother, Nellie, Dialitza's daughter. Together, Rasmussen and Beale worked to focus attention on the river that had sustained Rasmussen's family for generations and the creek that Beale credited with saving his life. They organized a broad constituency of public and private interests to support the restoration of Ham Creek and the larger Duwamish watershed. And in 1990, in partnership with the city of Seattle and King County, they created the Green Duwamish Watershed Alliance. A decade later, they recruited a coalition of native, environmental, social justice and neighborhood groups to create the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. By the time the EPA listed the river for Superfund cleanup in 2001, James and John were poised and ready to lead the charge for a river revival that would protect the health of all of the river's native and immigrant constituents. The rest, as they say, is history. In the years since, the river has transformed from the dumping ground I first saw in 1994 to a place where thousands of volunteers have restored riverfront habitat that had long since been destroyed. And the watershed's native people have been undertaking a cultural revitalization of their river traditions, resource uses, and political leadership in the Seattle area. Over the years, they've been joined in their efforts by new waves of immigrants, fishing families, longshoremen, recreational river users, and countless numbers of residents living in the river's historic waterfront neighborhoods of South Park, Georgetown, and Riverside. Many of these new immigrants and neighbors are now taking up the mantle of leadership for the river cleanup themselves. Paulina Lopez, pictured here, is a human rights law expert originally from Ecuador who chose to live in South Park because of its proximity to the river. She's recently become the newest director of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and says her focus is centered on the next generation. Lopez says she's determined to make sure that the Duwamish Valley communities have what they need not just to clean up their environment, but to remain healthy, strong, resilient, and in place while doing it. Lopez recently said, the wealth of Seattle was built right on the back of the Duwamish River. Sometimes I feel like we're being crushed. But then I wake up in the morning and I see our youth, how much potential they have. When she sees that, she says, I feel like we're building a movement. I think the folks that can best give you some perspective on the human dimensions of the past, present, and future of the watershed are those whose stories are partly told in the pages of the river that made Seattle. So without any more delay, I'd like to welcome James Rasmussen and hopefully Paulina Lopez, who will be joining me to answer questions from a few guest journalists and historians um, and from all of you in our audience here tonight as well. Um, are we ready? Hey to transition or did you want to wrap up your 
Oh, yes, please. Okay. So um, my name is Shane, and I'm an event manager here at Town Hall Seattle. And um, in just a moment, we're going to transition to your the audience questions. Um, so I, I invite you to, if you're on Crowdcast, you can submit your questions down below in the Ask the Question field. If you're on YouTube, I'm keeping an eye on that as well, and you can... Um, Put your questions in the chat and I'll ask them live on screen. But before we go to the audience Q&A, we have a few um, pre-submitted questions. So we have four of those and I'm just gonna, um, I'll ask them and then um, BJ along with James and Paulina will, will answer those for us. So our first question comes from Linda Mapes from the Seattle Times. She asks, in a situation where we need to set priorities for spending more carefully than ever as COVID creators budgets, how does the Duwamish compare to other salmon recovery opportunities? Why should money go there rather than, for instance, to a major salmon producer like the Skagit or to the Snake River salmon, which are at very high risk of extinction, but also crucial spring food for orcas? I guess I'll just start by saying a couple of things, but I have a feeling James has a few words on this as well. Um, and I would start by saying, you know, one, there is there is no part of Puget Sound that is a sacrifice zone. Um, and if we think of it in terms of places, we're forgetting about the people who live there and the people who depend on those places. Um, certainly the Duwamish communities don't consider themselves to be a sacrifice community. Um, and they're very, very uh, linked to and dependent on the river. So, um, so that's one point. But the other is, if we don't clean up the Duwamish River, we're not saving salmon in Puget Sound. Um, the Duwamish is one of the largest sources of PCBs to the entire Puget Sound ecosystem. And we need to be able to clean up the Duwamish if we want to be able to recover both salmon and orca anywhere in Puget Sound. James, did you want to add on? Um, I'd be happy to. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for, for coming. Um, but when we talk about salmon restoration in the, in the Green Duwamish watershed, um, what we're talking about is one of the last remaining wild salmon runs um, in Puget Sound. And, and that is through one of the most populated watersheds in the area. If we are going to have any luck um, in restoring and figuring out what we need to save throughout Puget Sound as Puget Sound becomes more populated, um, this is the place to find out how what we need to restore what we need to do and honestly a lot of work has already been done so it's not like a lot of work has to be done and honestly a lot of that work has been done because of the superfund site because there's a what goes along with it is the natural resource damage assessment which means that the major responsible parties are all responsible for creating new habitat in the river. We have probably more than doubled and will more than double the habitat that has been created in the past within the next five to 10 years. And that will create what we need to really hopefully restore salmon on, on the Green Duwamish watershed. And John, you, said, you said one thing that's also probably worth um, expanding on a little bit, which is that the Superfund cleanup is driving a lot of the restoration and that's being paid for by the people who polluted and the parties who polluted this river. That money's not available to be spent on restoration anywhere else. Correct. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And and so the, the efforts that we're doing here are going to be a book in which everybody else can look at. And honestly, the leadership that we show in restoration work and in cleanup work on the Duwamish River, no other city in Puget Sound is going to go beyond what we're doing. As a matter of fact, those areas are being developed. And how do we know what to save? We'll find, we will find that out here. And we will share that information. And we always have shared that information um, with other um, groups and other communities around Puget Sound. We should be, just as in creating the industrial area, showed, showed the leadership there. Now we can show how it can be balanced. And I think that's truly 
um, our goal, at least that we hope to see. A anything else you wanted to add to that? I, I have one little addition. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. And of course, thank you, BJ, for this wonderful creation of the book, of the stories. Um, we're very, very, very proud of the work that you've been doing. And to you all for attending tonight's town hall, um, the question really reflects, you know, like the need that we have also to mention that the river as the only river in Seattle, it's the only one that we have. Many people still are not familiar with it. And considering the history that it has, um, the rich history, the rich background and culture and made this city who we are. Um, unfortunately, didn't see we, we, through the years, we haven't seen the progress of it. And this is why we deserve a river that is clean. This is why the investment should be done here in the communities that have been impacted the longest by this um, super fun site and many different levels you know when we talk about water access when we talk about um environmental justice aspects um so we still hear the people still live in the river we still share a community with the industries um, but we do have a lot of generations to come and we all that have been working on our river on our community we see the benefit and dream one day that our children um, and the kids of our children will be enjoying without being worried what is getting in your mouth, in your lungs, in your system. And again, it will connect to the roots where we belong. So our second question comes from Canute Berger, AKA Mossback from Crosscut. What would a full, socially just, and feasible restoration of the Duwamish River look like? I want an image I can hold in my head of a, what a big vision outcome or goal is. I refer to <laughs> Paulina and James. I refer to my elder first. Uh, that's right. <laughs> um, a vision for the future of the Duwamish is one that um, it's not going to become a pristine river again. It's it's never going to be that because of where it is and the communities that are around it and the industries that are around it. But it is a place where um, industries still have an opportunity to thrive, that we had a good enough cleanup program where investment returns to the industrial area, which we really haven't had in a long time. And also that the communities that are there, um, South Park and Georgetown are thriving and thriving in place not gentrified and new people moving in um, that are that are buying up the houses that are there, but the families that have been there for generations, um, like Paulina's family that she's raised all of her kids at, and they have a respect for the river because they have been by it and understood it for a long time, but also for the fish and wildlife that are there as well. Um, that even today, when I started such a long time ago with John and the work that we did in the 80s. Um, um, you didn't see herons and other things that were there. Um, today, we have more variety of wildlife in the Duwamish than you have in any other place in the city of Seattle. And, and that includes the Arboretum and that includes Magnuson Park or wherever else you wanna go. And that's natural because it's the estuary it is where wildlife are driven to. That's where they go. And so all of those things working together and that the people that are fishing out of that river have the same risk as anybody who's fishing in Puget Sound. And that then we have something in the future that we can look to. Oh yeah, one more thing that I believe is incredibly important that the Duwamish tribes recognition will be accepted by the federal government and that the heart and soul of the river will be allowed to flow and the spirit of the river will be allowed to flow again with the recognition of the Duwamish tribe. Um, it is an injustice that they are not federally recognized at this point. And if you wanna get into it, um, 
It's about money. That's what it's about, period. End of story. Love you all. <laughs> Very similar to what James said. Um, if you can all close your eyes and picture Sophia, a seven-year-old that is enjoying a clean park with enough trees to go around her because she has asthma, but it's clearing because she has access to healthy fruits, healthy parks, a healthy environment that she hasn't enjoyed for the past generations or her mom and her grandma. Um, she also has access to whenever she wants to go swimming. She goes to have access if she wants to go fishing and practice her cultural um, beliefs, um, her bonding with the family. Um, Sophia also has a place that she feels secure to go and leave and she's not fearing that someone else is going to push her down so she can have a place to leave, um, a place that is, you know, well maintained, well healthy with no risks of mold, well, no risks of um, uh, jeopardizing her health even more. Um, so that's the image that I want you to have of how we envision our community. Sophia belongs to generations immigrant um, and she has the right to thrive in her life and have opportunities to that like any other Sophia's in the city have able have, will be able to. Um, so we we are looking for that and we are fighting for that and hopefully one day Sophia will be telling the story like we are. DJ, was there anything that you wanted to add? <laughs> no. I, I think they've covered it. I all right. A future River for all, mm -hmm. guided by respect, justice, and collaboration. So our third question comes from Jennifer Oat from History Link. She says, as an environmental historian, I am interested in how communities shape and are shaped by the environment in which they live. So I am wondering, have you seen a change in people's attitudes toward water resources over time? Yes. <laughs> um, let's kick off by saying, I think people increasingly understand that water is not a toy. It's not just there for recreation. Um, water is life, right? So um, our health, our wealth, our livelihoods depend on it. And I think people are increasingly coming to understand that um, and to act on it. I, I have certainly seen that over the last two decades. Anything um, that you want to add? Like you, like you were describing in your wonderful PowerPoint, VJ, all water connects. And I think some people have taken the time to understand that and what exactly that means. Um, and that is the vision that we're trying to do, you know, in our bodies, in the way that we react, that we build relationships with people and the way that we see the future, everything is water related in the good and in the bad. That's why we have to care for it. James, is there anything that you wanted to add? Well, real quickly, you can live a couple of weeks without food, but you can only live a couple of days without water. And even here in the Northwest, where we think we have an abundance of water, we have times where, where we have droughts and it becomes something that we have to conserve. And the more we're more aware and, and able to save and to do the right thing, the better off our future generations. And that means Magnolia and the north end of Seattle, as well as the south end of Seattle, Georgetown and South Park. We, we all need water. And the last real quick point, the citizens of the United States own the Duwamish River. It is not owned by the city. It's not owned by the industries. It's not owned by the Port of Seattle. And therefore, if we own it, we should be responsible for it. And we should look at it that way. You know, where there's so many people, sorry, I just jump very quickly, that ask, it's being hot in Seattle. And when you live into a beautiful, next to a beautiful river, 
We even have a, one of our co-workers right now, Robin is watching, but she's been yeah. desperate to go and, and get an advantage of that beautiful water that you see. If you see the river, it doesn't look dirty, it doesn't smell. Um, so it is important, you know, and I always say it's, it's like when you're on diet and you're looking at your chocolate, but you can eat it. It's right there. It's right there for people, but you cannot enjoy it because you can't get it too fully. So that's um, something that I'd like to remind people and what we need this river to be clean and to enjoy it fully. So this is our last uh, pre-Semitic question before we'll move to audience questions. This is from Robert McClure from Investigate West. One thing I love about the book is being surprised at so many aspects of the history of the river. I thought I knew a bit of the history, but loved learning about, for example, the role of beer and brewing and hops in the early development of the valley. What were your favorite historical sources? Which ones offered the most interesting and little known facts? Your sourcing was impeccable, but which were your personal favorites? <laughs> um, gosh, that's, that's uh, it's actually very easy. Um, James's Attic is my personal <laughs> favorite source of historical documentation and unbelievable. You know, I explained a little bit about um, how many generations, you know, he can trace his family back, but you know, so many of those generations are in the house that he still lives in today. And um, they've kept <laughs> where you see him sitting right now. Um, and, uh, and his family has, has kept those records. So there were, you know, there were other just incredible, wonderful sources. I loved working with the historic maps and going through probate records. I know that makes me sound like a geek. <laughs> um, and then volumes of another kind of top one, volumes of, of reports written by Indian agents, you know, government Indian agents in the 1800s. You know, those were all fascinating um, and great rabbit holes to, <laughs> to go down. But, um, but seven generations of photographs, of tax receipts, um, of personal correspondence that corroborated you know, oral histories um, from one of our leading Duwamish families. And, you know, that's that was just priceless. So um, this book honestly wouldn't have existed without that family documentation. Um, James wasn't the only family, but, you know, was a wealth of uh, the material that really allowed us to take a new look at, um, at what happened in the early years of settler and native um, interactions here. And, you know, who knew that that Native women were land barons. <laughs> you know, that kind of information wouldn't have come to light without James's attic. Anything for you, James or Paulina? Well, quite honestly, even though it was my attic, um, I learned an awful lot myself from from BJ um, as she was going through things, and then would come and ask me questions and. You know, in some cases, when somebody asks you about your family, you want to be knowledgeable about what's going on. But quite honestly, sometimes we only had bits and pieces of stories, and and she wove them all back together again. But what we're talking about for the overall book is truly the heart and soul of the city, and and we can't lose it. We we just can't lose it. Um, the passion that BJ shows in in her work. And that's not only the book, it is all of the things that she does. Um, and I remember the first time on the river that I met BJ, um, she was actually driving a pilot boat from the Elliott Bay Marina up the river. And, um, and, and me and John were coming down the river in, in the river patrol boat. And we see this young blonde girl um, on the boat and and here we are to kind of you know my had my beard then and um and you know john as bj described is not the most suave looking person in the world and here we are going oh my god here's a lovely young lady who cares about the river oh this is gonna be wonderful <laughs> and it actually wound up being wonderful the alliances that we put together, the work that we did together, and and what what has come out of that, uh, I I think is incredibly important. 
um, we have casualties along the way. Um, and and that that is sad all the time. Um, you know, People for Puget Sound, which used to be a, an amazing organization who was part of our coalition, is now a smaller part of the Washington Environmental Council. It still exists, but it, not to the extent that it existed before. Puget Sound Keeper is still there. Environmental Coalition of South Seattle is still there. But um, what's the other environmental justice organization, PJ? Community Coalition for Environmental Justice. CCEJ, um, which is one of the first environmental justice organizations in the country, um, is no longer around anymore. Um, their nonprofit status still exists with Got Green. Um, so they're still organizations and new alliances are being formed all the time um front and centered is is a very much a partner of the work that we're doing today and that connects us with environmental justice communities throughout the state of washington and there's all kinds of things that that we're working on including working with major environmental organizations in the region to make them understand why involving people of color is important to their organizations. And environmental organizations have been strictly upper middle white or white upper middle class people for such a long time and not realizing that where the work is really being done is in the communities that we're working with. And you need to have those people with you. And those things are starting to change today. So um, it's been slow, but it's worked well. And um, I'm so proud of people like Paulina, and then also proud of um, kids that started in our youth corps years and years ago are now working for us. And they are incredibly effective. You know, the new generation is coming. We don't have to look for them, they're there. We have them. And, and you know, even though I'm, I'm an old man, you know, I got Paulina there, who I know that she's going to do a great job for many years. And then after her, we have many other people just ready to take it up. So I'm, I'm eager to hear some audience questions. All right. Are, are you get all the three of you ready to move on to that? OK. Um, so again, I invite you, if you have a question, to submit it in the Ask the Question box um, down below. Or if you are over on YouTube, you can put it in the chat. Um, but before we go to questions, we have a comment um, from John Collegro. Um, my apologies, I've, I mispronounced your last name. Um, and let's see if I can. Uh, fully get what you're trying to say. Um, we have seven members of Unleash the Brilliance at Friday Harbor Labs studying ecology and conservation. They are here because they have met you and have worked on the Duwamish watershed. So I wanted to share that. Um, Unleash the Brilliance is a wonderful youth group. Yeah. So our first question comes is from... Brilliant. Sorry, what was that? No, okay. Oh, no, I said they are all indeed brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, our first question comes from Sheila, and they ask, um, what is happening with the super fund? That's for James, I think. Um, uh, being the super fund manager for the Duwamish River um, <laughs> Cleanup Coalition, um, right now, we super fund process is a long process. Um, remedial investigation, where's the contamination, all that type of stuff. Um, feasibility study, um, how many different ways can it be cleaned up. And then we've got seven early action areas or places that were on the Duwamish River that were so polluted um, that we didn't want to wait for a full river plan to clean up those areas. Places like Boeing Plant 2, um, T117, um, Jorgensen Forge, um, anyway. All of those now are clean up. So probably about half of the sediment in the river is much cleaner than it was before. Um, as we go through the next step, it's the, we already have the um, record of decision, which is the outline of how the river is to be cleaned up by EPA. And that came from 
the proposed plan and lots of comments and those type of things. Um, but then through the record of decision, which gives you an outline of how the whole river is to be cleaned up, then what EPA has decided to do is to divide the river into thirds. And we're starting with the upper third of the river, the cleaner part of the river right now. And then we're coming up with what EPA calls the remedial design. Everything is different in EPA language or cleanup design. Um, specifically engineering on how to clean up the river, which right now is testing. Testing the river in specific areas to find out exactly how things might have changed over the last 10 years. And, and then from that, we'll be able to start really designing that part of the river's cleanup. And that should actually start within the next three to five years, um, hopefully. Um, but we have to make sure we do things right. And some people have said, how come it's not done yet? Well, if, if you're gonna do a good job, there's an awful lot of research that has to be done. And the community has to be involved in the process as well. And so this is something that makes a cleanup better. And if we're doing things right, we take time with it. Um, that's incredibly important. But that's where we are right now. And quite honestly, the process that we're working with EPA on is a roundtable process that the community, agencies, um, tribes, um, institutions, as well as um, EPA and the Department of Ecology are all part of this um, and working together to actually design the cleanup itself rather than step, step, step that we've done before in the past. And one other really quick thing, um, because DRCC is there and because we work with the community and make sure that that voice is lifted up, each one of those early actions including going from the um, proposed plan to um, the record of decision, each step has been strengthened because of community input, every step. So it is the communities that you have to thank for, for having as good a cleanup as we have at this point. DJ or Paulina, do you wanna add anything to that? No? Okay. Um, so sort of tying into that, Jonathan um, had said, the federal government has appropriately spent um, millions of dollars around the Pacific cleaning up battlefields from World, World War II. Much of the pollution of the Duwamish River occurred as part of the war effort, B-17 and loading of munitions, etc. Is the river considered a battlefield and eligible for restoration with full U.S. funding reflecting the contribution to the war? Not not sure. No, I, I'm 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 pretty sure it's not. Um, yes, the the B-17 bombers were built right on the Duwamish River and were a big contributor to the pollution. Um, this is where Rosie the River comes from. Um, anyway, um, but it, it's not considered a battlefield in, in any way, shape, or form. Thank God we were during World War II when my mother was being raised. We were worried that we might be. That's why Boeing Plant 2 had an artificial hill on top of it so people wouldn't see it from the sky. Yeah, there, there were, interestingly, some internment and POW camps scattered around, but um, but never a battlefield, yeah. Um, Sheila, another question from Sheila, she asks, uh, why was industry built along the river? Did they think of going inland? <laughs> um, I, can, I can give a quick, quick uh, kind of two driving factors. Um, one I alluded to a little bit uh, in giving the, showing you the maps and giving you the tour. Um, Seattle was full of hills, absolutely everywhere. We flattened a bunch of them, but you mm -hmm. know, it's still a hilly city and it was a much hillier city once upon a time. Um, the only area that the industrial developers saw as flat enough to, um, to actually be useful for, uh, for building large industrial facilities was the flats around the river, right? So the land was suitable there. You just had to make it more solid, fill in some old, you know, pesky meanders, but the land was flat enough that you could actually build large industrial facilities. And then secondly, the river was a feature that they wanted. The river 
was both transportation in for goods and transportation out for waste. So without the river, they would have had to have um, invested a lot more in getting goods in and waste out. So the river was a very convenient, relatively inexpensive way of, of having that transport um, of goods and transport of garbage. Anything you want to add, James or Paulina? No? OK, so our next question comes from Paul. Paul asks, what are your visions for how people of the river communities will interact with the river in the future? <laughs> I, I think, I think, thank you for that question. Um, and I'm just going to refer a little bit to uh, what we were saying at the beginning, you know, with how um, we already have a sense of pride of having our river here. We, we, we walk to it and honor it every time. Uh, but we, want to enjoy it fully. Um, we want to make sure that people understand the history, the respect that this river brings us. Um, but we also want to see, um, you know, our, our habitat living in there in, in a good way. We want to see our people um, if feeling free, free and, and enjoying um, the place, um, a historic place. Uh, but we, we want to have recreational activities. Um, we want our youth to be enjoying by canoes, by kayaks. We want them to have opportunities to go out and fish if they want to. Um, our communities to practice their culture in there. And we want to also see jobs opening for our people. Like we don't see reflected that economic opportunities that this river has been providing to to the city overall it reflected back into us so we want we want to generate professionals that are going to be taking these jobs that are going to be running um, the industries around it we are not thinking of getting rid of the industries we want to make sure that we're working alongside so our communities take advantage of the jobs and opportunities that exist and I think it's important to just say one blunt thing. The um, next to the Museum of Flight, there's uh, there's a high school that is des dedicated um, for for kids. You know that that focuses on aeros, you know, airplanes and all that type of different thing, which is a wonderful opportunity for a lot of kids that don't live in the valley. And hopefully, in the future, what we'll see in maybe South Park is a maritime high school, a place where kids can understand what the industries are in the Valley and then get a head start and be able to be part of, of this wonderful industries that we have in the Valley and the port and everything else. And there's a lot of support right now for it, um, but we have to say something whenever we get an opportunity. That is a goal. That is something that I think we look at as the other side of the river from from what's going on at the aviation high school. And I was actually that was actually uh, proposed by our youth. They they actually were the ones who said we want to have a high school that is going to lifting up our river. and We want to understand how to care for it and how to work for the for it. All right, so we have time for two more questions. Um, this next one is from Robert McClure, and they ask, um, what do you think the Black Lives Matter and similar movements will mean for the Duwamish Valley generally? And what about for the Superfund cleanup? How much can the cleanup plan be changed through later reviews? Those are two very different questions. <laughs> really quickly start um, the, the revelation of Black Lives Matter is not nothing is nothing new to DRCC. Um, we have been working with those facts um, for a long time, understanding the what what influence um, society has on minorities and and gang violence and all of that type of stuff has a devastating response or a devastating action in the community. And so I, I, you know, that part of it, yes. The other part of it, um, 
it how is that going to change what we're doing i i am we're working on that we we are regularly in con conversation with epa and ecology we're also regularly in conversation with responsible parties and that we hope that we're going to have a, a program to be able to train community members or anybody who wants to to be able to be part of that cleanup um it's part of the epa's program the um super fund job training initiative and we did it once about eight years ago and we're going to do it again um, when timing is right on the full river cleanup so um those are those are things that that we look at and and we are very aware of and i'll the rest to paulina um i think you well said it james for for us the work is just lifting up even more what we have been doing and and bringing more allies into breaking these uh, racist structures that we are usually have to be dealing with. Um, we, we um, as an organization, have been always prioritizing um, the people that had been impacted the most, the people that usually um, was already exposed to racism in many different shapes and forms. Um, so uh, I, I want to instead invite you all to all the people that are here to join the movement, to join the fight for those who have been left behind, who have not been part of the table. And people have been making decisions on their behalf that were not necessarily the right decisions. Um, so we can all build that movement. You can join the organizations like ours, environmental justice groups, um, uh, black led organization groups, uh, people of color groups like representing uh, the BIPOC community. And um, yeah, we are all gonna need um, after that we can see um, how all this pandemic is impacting us all, definitely think that it's not really the impact to all of us equally. Um, there are communities that are going to need everyone's support in order to become resilient because they have been pushed and pushed back. So I want to join. make sure that you join this movement and this fight. Yeah, and I would just say that one of the most hopeful things um, things that have made me at least feel most hopeful is there's been a long alliance between Black and Indigenous people working on environmental justice issues. Um, and we are seeing, I think, the fruits of um, those long standing relationships and, and alliance building um, coming out now in the Black Lives Matter movement as well. And I, you know, it's, it's hard, it's a reckoning, and I think it's essential. And I'm just, I'm so heartened to see it happening. And I'm so heartened, especially to see the youth that are leading. So this is going to be our last question for the evening. And um, James, I think this is mostly directed for you. Is the next generation of your family planning to continue the tradition or will the archival material pass to the Duwamish tribe or dot, dot, dot? How will that wonderful heritage be preserved? <laughs> I'm glad somebody asked that question because one of the things that BJ said in the book, um, which were, my family is very proud of, that my niece Christine um, served on the Duwamish Tribal Council. Um, but one thing that really wasn't mentioned, and I'm not sure, is, is my sister um, also served on the Duwamish Tribal Council, and um, so it's it's pretty much all of my family. It's been part of it. Now my sister is seven years older than me, so that's not the next generation. But for my family, it's Christine. Um, and there's going to be a lot of stuff. Um, and how we deal with all of that and everything else, we're, we're starting to talk about now. But it's not just my family, because my family's related to many families in the tribe. Um, and, and it's not just the tribe. It is now people that are connected with the tribe. We have something called Real Went Duwamish which is an incredible um, operation and, and something that um, I, I would uh, at least let everybody Google it and find out what it's about, you know, because it's a wonderful thing going on in, in the city and in the region. Um, but that connects all those people. Um, it's like the connection between the Longhouse Cultural Center 
and the Log House Museum on the other side, which is more of the history of the white settlements that were here. Um, we have a connection. We're all related. We're part, you know, we're part of that history and that's important. Um, but as we move on, I quite honestly, I can tell you that um, I have kids that when I was in tribal council um, that today can speak the language, which I cannot do, know the dances, know the songs, um, and, and all of those type of things. That was something that I never had the opportunity to do. Um, just as we look in the Duwamish Valley and look at kids that are moving up, the tribe also has those kids. And, and they're, they're going to be stronger, and they're going to be much better. Um, and it'd be really good if the rest of the city would just notice that. And pay rent, the Wamish, rent the Wamish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes our program this evening. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, and I, I want to give a big thank you to BJ, James, and Paulina for being here as well.